Thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, I take advantage that I have a microphone to thank all my friends here in Montreal who organized the MEC conference. MEC conference was started in 2009 and went uh, every year on in the New Jersey, New York area. And so uh, I think it was a very superb organization. I'm very happy to be here and maybe we'll continue with this tradition. We'll see. <laughs> So um, today I want to tell you a little bit about uh, a program um, who started, I started about 10 years ago in my own hospital and uh, I love the title of uh, the talk, Before That There Is Life. This is a quote from Cecily Saunders which has been my uh, mentor from above, uh, my inspiration um, uh, in, in what I, I built. Um, because of her idea to live a full life before the end comes. No conflict of interest. So this is my outline. I will talk a little bit about how this program came about and then some clinical research and uh, um, uh, educational project that we develop over time because I don't want my program to die with me. So we are towards the future. Now, um, I found uh, um, also very interesting, intriguing, the title of the MEC conference of this year of the risk of medicine, because to me, it, it can be read in many ways, but to me, uh, for sure, uh, represent the risk that I um, hold when I decide to take care of a patient, is a risk, is a dramatic relationship, but also, I foresee the risk of the patients putting themselves in my hands. And this drama becomes even more intense when the patient is a baby. So parents um, entrust the life of their child to my, to my care. And so it's a very, very challenging, dramatic uh, relationship. Now, this uh, sentence, you can read here, um, we found on a corridor wall in my hospital, and Andrew Franz was the admitting dean of medical school from 1981 to 2010. And this phrase represents um, his criteria to admit a medical uh, student to medical school, um, which I thought was very interesting. And also, he, it reminds me the question that uh, I, he I hear all the time from parents uh, of the babies I take care of. Um, would I want this doctor to come in into my baby's room as his or her physician? They look at me with, uh, uh, with struggle, with, um, you know, they're very worried, they're very concerned, as I mentioned before. This is a very dramatic relationship. And so, uh, in my institution at Columbia University, we have an exceptional um, survival rate for uh, newborns. Um, this, is, this holds for our baby with very low gestational age, very low birth weight, babies with every kind of condition. We do heart surgery. We are really premier in, in the United States. Uh, however, we do meet uh, um, babies prenatally or postnatally diagnosed with uh, what we call life-limiting condition, condition that the medical science cannot uh, take care of. We cannot heal those babies. And so uh, I stand in front of that question of the parents, how do I answer that? First of all, I know that babies with life-limiting condition have a life. Can be minutes, can be days, weeks, sometimes years, as I'll show you a couple of examples. And uh, uh, I envision for them a medical care who will respect the natural length of life. That was, those were my two principles that I, I learned from Cecily Saunders and I kept um, as a, a general rule for what I built. So um, our program honors the lives of babies with life-limiting condition by offering services of perinatal and neonatal palliative care and uh, we are very much committed in teaching the research because we want to fulfill our vision, which is that our specialized approach will become the standard of care around the world, exactly with those two characteristics that I told you before, 
One, that life should be lived fully from the beginning till the natural end. Um, I started on my own. I start, uh, um, so as a neurologist, I, I give prenatal counseling to families. And at a certain point, I ended up, uh, not for my will, I was invited to um, counsel families expecting babies to be born with life-limiting conditions. And so I start following that family. I became the doctor of those babies. I follow the clinical course. I discharge the mom. But the number increased over time a lot. There are people in New York, family in New York, who comes to deliver in my hospital because they know about this program. And so the possibility to uh, bond with their babies. Um, and, and so over the course of the time, I have to reach on to... Um, uh, philanthropists, uh, donors, people who, um, you know, gave me money over time. So I was able to hire three full-time uh, person, a nurse, a social worker, bilingual, we need Spanish, and a manager. And they also supported a lot of our educational project. Now, also people in the NICU, nurses, fellows, um, and other professionals, speech pathologists, uh, a lactation consultant, et cetera, help us in our effort because the numbers you'll see are growing over time. So let's talk about a little bit of clinical work. What do we do? The main work that we do is what I define and I like to call the perinatal journey. Our, our team meet the families before the baby is born and we give an option. Now, these are families who receive a terrible news by their obstetricians, and uh, uh, the way I meet them, I gave them an option as a neonatologist. I say, you know, my job is to save baby's life. I studied at school to become a neonatologist, so that's what I do. Your baby has this condition, and uh, I foresee a life of whatever it is. I give the prognosis, etc. But uh, my proposal is, uh, should we walk together through this path? And so um, we, built a, um, we built a journey together. Now, the fundamental point of the journey together and the difference of my program in comparison with others, maybe, although there are not that many, um, is a network of support. So I work with my team to support families before and after birth. We are very strong in feeding because we believe in natural length of life. And so if you feed the little baby, uh, they may be lived more than expected. We do rooming in. And so we don't want these babies to go to the NICU with monitors and in incubators. We want babies to stay with mommy. And we do a follow up. We follow families along, for, with some of them along life. So how this uh, perinatal journey starts? With the obstetrician referral, I sit down with the parents, and as I mentioned before, I develop a plan of care. Now, these are families that either they don't know which decision make during the pregnancy, or they make up their mind. In our population of Colombia, we have a significant numbers of families for which termination of pregnancy is not an option. Uh, we have uh, a um, large number of um, Jewish Orthodox, of Catholic, Christian, Muslim, and also many parents who maybe had problem, uh, they went through many IVF, and so whatever babies they're expecting, that's it, that's their child. And so um, our program came in a moment in which was really needed. Um, okay. Now, I tend to be present at every of these deliveries, Obviously, I work with my fellows. If it happens at 3 in the morning, maybe they are there. I prepare them. I train them. But all is available to help and support. And I became the primary care physician of these babies as they live, maybe for a certain time. And the plan of care is really uh, bonding, feeding them. F uh, feeding for a baby is uh, um, a source of joy, as you know, wherever as children. And so uh, we want our lactation consultant to be involved. We have our speech pathologist to be involved. Why? We don't just throw down an NG tube. We want the baby to have fun with the mom feeding. And so she, for example, over the course of the years, built up uh, uh, special nipples to facilitate a safe feedings of baby who had uh, facial or oropharyngeal abnormalities. And so. We try to facilitate what is natural, what the, parent, the parents feel uh, that feed is like a, a, 
giving life. No? And so obviously we're not calculating calories or you know, forcefully feed those babies, but we want uh, um, feeding to be a joy. And pain and discomfort management. Now, uh, neonatologist present here knows very well, with this population, once you hold your baby, you give a little food, um, you keep them warm, there is, you know, very rarely we need to use morphine drops or fentanyl intranasal, very, very rarely. Mm -hmm. Death in this b uh, category of babies is a very peaceful event. Uh, and so, my, so when the babies, you know, carry around by the family, we don't even know when they actually, the, the heart stopped, just to say how peaceful is the experience. Um, we uh, decide to break a rule in my hospital of the four hours when the families w was, were allowed to keep the babies after that. We decide that there is no four hours, there is no time. If the parents wants to keep the baby for a long time, they should, because there is no reason to do differently. And so we also have a, a cold mattress where they can place the baby. And so the baby can stay overnight, can stay for two or three days with the family according to their wishes. Remember, for parents, this is the only time they have the baby with them. And so it's very important. We do have also a bereavement program, which continues supporting this family. I'm going very fast because the time is short. So. Now, uh, I want to talk about two special achievements that we um, gain during these years. The first is the special case of pre-viable babies. So th there are ba so there are babies born at 18, 19, 20 weeks of gestational age because just the labor went on and you couldn't stop it. And some of these babies, they have a heart rate. They come out, they move an arm or leg or something. They have signs of life. But in general, these babies are um, classified at least, uh, you know, in my hospital or in general, I think, in the United States as uh, stillborn, okay? And uh, we went back to read the New York State law and it's a definition of live birth. So any baby, irrespectively of the duration of pregnancy, who breathes or shows any other evidence of life, such as beating of the heart, etc., etc. Also, we understood how important for a family is to have a birth certificate and a death certificate, because it's like the acknowledgement of society that that baby was a person. And so we introduced a new, new guidelines where basically the obstetrician um, uh, declared the baby alive, when is the case, obviously, uh, and then we neonatologists go when baby the, the baby's heart stops to declare and to uh, write the death certificate. This is an example of a, a little baby at tw uh, 21 weeks who lived for seven hours. So life for this baby was the heart was beating. That's it. Mom did the skin to skin. She did a bunch of pictures and, uh, and I have permission to show pictures to you, by the way. Um, but we realized that psychologically it's so important for her to, to hold the baby and to have a certificate who says, yes, my baby was alive. So, but this is the best achievement. So in the course of this year, we um, brought about a culture change. And those two pictures shows the difference. So traditionally, babies with life-limiting condition are taken to the NICU, put in an incubator. They need to have a monitor because you must have a monitor in intensive care unit. And as you can see from the picture of the baby, uh, privacy is almost impossible because the NICU is very crowded and a bonding is impossible because mom just delivered a baby. She can stand at the bedside holding her baby day and night. And so over the course of these 10 years, with a lot of teaching, putting ourselves as role uh, models, um, staying with the nurses in postpartum, showing that it was really professional, et cetera, we change now to this other scenario in which the mom and the family, they have a private room, the baby's there, and we professionals are discreetly there. You know, I do my rounds with my fellow. Is the, does the baby need anything? How is the feeding today? Uh, or if we are at the end of life, does it need a drop of morphine? Does, you know, mommy, how do you feel the baby's doing? And so we participate uh, with a lot of discretion um, to the family celebration. And if you want to see numbers, these are the numbers. So in the first few years when we started the program, most babies came to the NICU like it happened all over. And now in the past uh, four or five years, 88% of those babies, they go to postpartum. And uh, you know, our nurses are 
proud of this new uh, professional knowledge that they have and it's very um, it's beautiful for them to to be to be able to help families in this kind of situation I want to show you the numbers of uh, prenatal consults i had personally for babies with life limiting condition which as i mentioned before continues to increase over time because there is a word of mouth um, that babies um, in our hospital, if they're born with life-limiting condition, have palliative care, and they can stay with mom and dad. And what happened to these babies? So, for example, in 2018, we follow um, this um, 69 pregnancy. We had uh, 11 uh, intrauterine fetal demise, but we followed them also the delivery and for bereavement afterwards, no matter what. In 15 cases, the diagnosis was not sure 100%, so we always check the baby after the baby is born, obviously. And so 15 babies went back to the unit, they were treated. And in 43 cases, we had comfort care, mainly in, uh, in the rooming inn. Now, most of these babies, as you see on the right, died within the first few days of life. I'm talking about cases of renal agenesis, anencephaly, limb body wall, so um, condition where early demise is expected, but we do have also babies with trisomy 18, trisomy 13, and other, um, let's say, life-limiting genetic condition may be associated with severe uh, heart condition, brain condition, where life can be a little longer than uh, um, just a few days. We have also occasional longevity, and I'll share a case with you. Okay, this is a little girl um, who was prenatally diagnosed with uh, what you see on the top, so she had heterotaxy, right dominant AV canal, double outlet right ventricle, and she had very severe pulmonary stenosis. Um, the parents were just immigrate from Nigeria, they had other two children, and the route to go for the single ventricle repair was definitely too much for them. Too much suffering for the baby, too much from any point of view. And, and we do offer a palliative care to parents carrying a baby with uh, single ventricle anatomy. So the baby came out, the uh, doctor said also was open, also she, this is a mixing lesion, right? And so she behaved like a normal child, to tell the truth. She went to postpartum, she was breastfed. And we send her home with support with the hospice, not because she looks sick. And by the way, in New York State, you can have hospice going home for any possible case. I mean, there is not su such a thing like in the, with the adults, the person should die within six months. You can set up hospice for basically anything. So then, um, well, then the hospice nurse will go, but you know, she didn't do much because the baby was actually behaving well. On the right, you see her picture six months and she looks fine. Now what happened, so our, she came once in a while, every two, three months, to do echocardiogram and to do pediatric follow-up, and the expectation was her pulmonary stenosis would become so tight that she would become progressively epoxic and die. And see what happened. She turned one, and I went to her birthday party. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you put a mo saturation monitor, she's in like high 70s, low 80s, but babies with single ventricle, they live the life with that saturation. So nothing different than average. Um, and on the right, you see her picture at three years old. So what happened to her body? Her body is taking care of itself. She developed a huge amount of collaterals. So she had okay blood flow to the lungs. Now, will she live like me and you as long as me and you? I don't know, I don't think so. However, she lived the first three years of her life home, having a great life, um, versus babies who undergo three open heart surgeries and eventual transplant and everything. I'm not, you know, I take care of babies uh, with surgery with a single ventricle, and most of the family decide to do surgery in my hospital, and I'm glad that, that there is a possibility. But that's not for all families. For some families, they would rather have a shorter life, but a better quality of life. Okay, uh, time is running. So let me share with you um, about a little bit about our research project and our educational project. Why I decided to start uh, research and education? Because um, I see so many families coming and uh, I, I understand uh, how good is this option for families who 
if given this option, will really would like to uh, have their child alive in their arms when the baby is born and to follow the babies for whatever length of life is given. And so I felt that this program cannot die with me. I need to do something that remain. And so I start to see, well, does it work? Are these babies comfortable, for example? So uh, as you know, be comfortable is not just not having pain. Be comfortable is much more than that, no? So we do have pain scores, which most of the time with this baby doesn't even apply because the baby is like sleeping. And so how do I quantify the comfort? And so we thought, let's ask parents. And so we uh, started a study offering to parents of babies who are treated in our program um, to answer an anonymous questionnaires with uh, 24 uh, quantitative statement um, to wanted to explore how was the environment when the baby was in the hospital, how did we care for the baby and their own opportunity to bond. And we had also questions like, uh, was your baby comfortable or many other questions. And what the results shows that, uh, um, as you can see, the mean score was quite high for items where the higher score meant more comfort and quite low for items where um, higher score means less comfort, so the opposite. And so overall, uh, from a quantitative point of view, parents showed satisfaction and appreciation for their baby's comfort. And as a matter of fact, uh, we are in, in contact with many of them. And uh, we also um, ask them to write a narrative answering the question, how would you describe comfort care with a metaphor or an image? And these are just few of the many that we receive. Um, comfort care is pure love, unadulterated longing for goodness. Comfort care is like a hug. Comfort care is a band that helps healing, an umbrella that tries to protect the baby, a beautiful calming corridor between this world and the next. So we came out, um, you know, uh, comforted also us <laughs> for what we are doing. Um, we do also offer palliative consult in our NICU. The acuity in our NICU is very, very high. And so uh, I'm called for a consult very, very often. And again, uh, how do I work in our NICU? For a, a small amount of, uh, a small, um, small number, 13, for example, 2018, I came to facilitate conversation and uh, uh, redirection of goal of care, end of life care. But for 33 families, we were there just to help with quality of life. And uh, I want to uh, give you an idea of what we are doing, showing you another study. So our team, we are full of ideas. And so we decide to, um, um, to put together a new tool to uh, facilitate early palliative care. And we call him BACI, which means kisses in Italian, but stays for baby attachment comfort interventions. And uh, we decide to uh, prove, to validate uh, this tool, uh, measuring stress of parents of baby very, very, very sick in our cardiac NICU. And so we use a couple of uh, psychological tests, which are not the best to describe, but whoever a psychologist here maybe knows them, the NUPS and uh, the DAST-21. The, sorry, the DAST-21. So how was the intervention? Uh, we sit down with the family for a typical palliative conversation. Where do you think your baby is going? How do you feel for your baby? What is important to you? What can we do to help you and your baby, et cetera, et cetera. And we develop meaningful, meaningful intervention with the family according to their needs and according to the status of the baby. Of course, we, decide, we, we discuss also with the primary team. And basically, we propose four uh, domains intervention. One, bonding. So holding the baby, touching the baby, which was facilitated by our nurse, or along with the nurses in the NICU. Feeding, our sp uh, feeding specialist, could be food, could be colostrum care, could be anything that resembled the act of feeding a baby. Memories, which are life. And then we offer support with our social worker, our <coughs> psychologist, and chaplaincy. And what to me was very interesting, if you noticed, so, we um, um, measure the stress of the parents at the at first in a group of 51 parents uh, before doing this intervention. Um, 
when the baby was born and just before the baby went home. And then we start the intervention and uh, we measure again with this other group of parents uh, um, the stress uh, at the admission of the baby and uh, a discharge. And then as you can see here in the gray, um, the great, uh, the gray uh, histogram refers to the control. So those parents, they have no change in their stress from the beginning till the day when they go home, which is very interesting also per se as a data. But the parents who received the intervention had significantly decreased stress. And so I think this validates really the entrance of uh, the palliative care in, in our uh, intensive care unit. And I finish with our educational project also. Um, um, we, di we, we did for uh, all these years <coughs> to try to convey other physicians, other nurses, other centers to follow our approach uh, yearly workshop, but this year we decide to do a further step and we organize uh, a real three-day training, a boot camp, uh, where uh, we had about uh, 10 instructors and we collect, uh, we, we wanted to um, not only to give academic lectures, but to do hands-on demonstration, how to do prenatal counseling, how to do NICU counseling, how to provide uh, a bonding to the fa family, sorry, <coughs> family when your baby is full of tubes in the, in the NICU or when your baby weighs 400 grams. And so um, we, uh, these are the instructors, okay. So we, thank you. We had uh, about 90 attendees from 19 states for the United States. We have doctors and nurses for Australia, Burundi in, in Africa, Canada, England, Italy, Russia. And, um, and again, uh, you know, for whatever of you is uh, in the field of perinatology, um, aside Dr. Ferretti, there is not much there. And uh, this discipline does not exist. Perinatal palliative care does not exist. And so I'm, I'm really, looking, me and my team, looking into um, fulfill our vision to bring this all over the world because it's necessary for those families and those babies. And with this, I thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. Um, now, Elvira has daughter Saunders, um, Cecile Saunder. I have Elvira, I can phone her, <laughs> am I lucky? <laughs> and um, um, before saying anything, I really um, have to say that as Elvira um, helped me in the first steps of my baby steps in medicine and in pediatrics for a very, unfortunately, very short time because she flew for America, uh, in Italy. I, I really um, have to thank her because um, this is a project among other projects, okay? Um, but the inspiration that Elvira, through all these years, has given me, um, um, not only as a physician, as a neonatologist, but also as a person that believes that lives before death and after death, it's important. So thank you. Um, now, I do believe that, um, uh, I, I liked also the title and, um, you know, because um, we say before death is, there is life and then, uh, but I think that um, usually um, you say that it takes a village to ri raise a child. It's a common way of saying that I heard here I, I learn here in Canada. But I would say that um, it really takes a, a village to um, um, take care of a child that it might not ever be, become an adult. Um, and this is an experience that I wanted to, um, to share with you. So how, um, conflict, none. Uh, so all it started, it was about three years ago. Um, I knew what Elvira was doing, right? Um, but I, it never occurred to me that that was going to be one day uh, something that would, you know, hit me in my daily work. So three years ago, I was called um, for a stat C section for a twin pregnancy, 
and um, I went into the delivery room and um, um, while one baby girl was kicking and screaming and crying, the other one was lifeless. So this was completely unexpected by, uh, by the team, the, the MFM team in particular that was following this pregnancy so closely. And um, so we went to uh, disclose the, 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 the news, the bad news, the, the good news and then the bad news at the same time, right? Um, uh, to the parents, they were devastated. And so I decided the day after I was going to see her again, the mother, because I was sure the parents would have, um, you know, um, questions. And when uh, I came to see her, um, she um, obviously was there um, with her husband, and uh, I saw in a cot, in the same cot, um, the alive baby and then the death baby. Um, so, uh, and the mother looked at me and she said, I'm gonna stay here for three days um, uh, because I, she had a cesarean, right? And, um, and then we're gonna go home. And um, I, at that point, um, I wasn't 100% I wasn't sure about what the cause and the um, MFM th said, oh, maybe there is an infection for the, for the bigger baby. Why? Um, and so I was thinking three days, um, you know, with both babies, about her attachment, about, you know, but anyway, I, I really truly uh, say when the mother says, are they, really they look alike because we're all bundled, you know, when they brought it to her. Um, and I said, yeah, they are very, lo they look alike, but I said, instead of using the expression that you usually say here in Canada that you look like two peas in a pod, <laughs> which I never liked it as an expression, I said, your baby girls look like two drops of water, like they look like, you know, two drops of rain, actually, I use that expression. Then I continue to do my, my stuff. Exactly a year later, I received this email from her. I knew that, she, um, that her sister knew somebody in Ottawa that knew me, and so she got my email. And um, um, I read this letter, and then I paused, and I had a lot of thinking to do. You know, it, it didn't leave me indifferent at all. So, and this is the only thing that we're gonna read. So, there is much guilt for me in grieving F death, is the name of the baby, obviously. Guilt that there was no mother's instinct that told me something bad was going to happen that I could try to prevent. Guilt that I spent my pregnancy complacent that everything was going so well. Guilt that I did or didn't do something during my pregnancy that somehow hurt her but also smaller guilt from uh, after her birth because I didn't see all of her or bath her or get all the photos I want to know to remember her. At the time, I remember wanting to keep her bundled and warm, and we just didn't unwrap her much other than for photos of her hands and feet. Did you see her before she was wrapped up? Were they as similar unwrapped? I remember you told me that they were like two drops of rain. That was a beautiful comment, and saying that has stuck with me. She went on and on and on about uh, the guilt again. And then, thank you for all the attention and care you showed to my babies at their birth. I will always be thankful for the small blessing of that day, which included your care and the sharing of that beautiful quote. I was I was in tears when I read this a year later. Now, one thing, that, one thing that I didn't tell you is that she wrote that letter the same day that she gave birth to a son. And she was in desperation, she was desperate. She could not enjoy and she needed to talk to me about it, about a year before when she had the baby girls born. So. Obviously, I had to think hard about the unavoidable guilt versus the preventable guilt that we all, as nurses, um, practitioners, are called towards our patients. 
And um, the guilt that this mother carried prevented her to enjoy the subsequent pregnancy and even the, the joy of a new child, which is huge. Um, and um, I also uh, truly realize, I always read it in literature, but uh, you know, like that what you say is remembered for, to a patient, is remembered forever. The good and unfortunately the bad. And um, also I realized that um, there is not, nothing worse than a pain in a person that is not recognized or acknowledged. Now, she couldn't talk about her baby girl that was, that, that was dead, dead um, to her husband for the whole year until this new baby boy arrived. So, and this one, just the, the tip of the iceberg, right? At the same time, after the cesarean section and after the fact that I have two baby girls, one dead and one boy, for three days in the unit, I asked my colleagues, I say, what are the policies at the hospital? Everybody look at me like, what are you asking? You know, like there is no policy in the hospital for this. I said, so how, how, can, how many days or hours can stay together in the same cot? What about one is infected and is ID involved in these cases? You know, if you have a suspicion of infection, nothing. Um, and so I realized that in my hospital, that, for which I worked for almost 10 years, 12 years, babies were born to die in our hospital without adequate physician, support, physician or nurses support. Barriers existed to incorporate a CHEO holistic palliative care because, um, uh, option because there is a palliative care team and a palliative care program which are also going to see Elvira and learn how to, this year they went to see um, the, you know, her, um, her workshop, the three day the boot camp and um, you know, to learn more about, about it because they can do services but usually they serve you know, the NICU when babies are, uh, are going to die. And so the, we call them and they help us to deal with either medication because they're bigger babies and complex. Then also other aspect related not only to the ID issue, but the, the twins, like the attachment, you know, I'm thinking about a mother that is not fully en so enjoying for a baby that is born, but at the same time, you know, she is grieving at the same time. She, she is nourishing one. She's grieving for the other one that is dead, and all these things. And also, I felt at that point very challenged. And God knows me, if He doesn't give me something rushy, I'm not going to move my butt. So, I really felt challenged because I was asking myself, how is it possible that there is no dignified way to die in this tertiary hospital outside from the NICU? I knew my reality, right? But I. It was very the first time that I hit a wall. Somebody needed to do something, right? Haha. <laughs> so I went around and I asked colleagues and I said, we need to do something. And uh, um, I realized that the complexity of the task could not be addressed uh, by using exclusively individualistic competency or competing skills, okay? Competent skills. The work process for the management of the doubt. It was very important because I, um, the doubt there was always constant. Like, what does it mean to improve the life of uh, an individual or the patient or the family? What does it take to reach that goal? And these were only two small questions that, you know, uh, in front of the magnitude of question and all the details that you have to go into the life of another person, of a person. And so I realized, you know, that in the village I need to find somebody with me that would um, take this challenge. And I really knocked doors to people, went on and on and on to people, and probably Elvira did the same at that time when 10 years ago she started all of this, but, you know, it was really hard. People were discouraging me. They were saying, has been tried in the past and has been failed miserably. Don't even try. The JPCC is not going to uh, agree with you. Uh, they're going to, you know, it's really, really close to the issue of the termination, which we don't want to open. It's a kind of worm. And uh, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I found all these wonderful collaborators that they started with me um, a, a perinatal palliative care program. So how does my village look like? So this is a, a picture from my office. So you see here on the bottom, the Ottawa Hospital. 
can I? Me? This one? Just like that? Ah! So, this is the Ottawa Hospital. <laughs> then we walk through the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, where we have the, the other NICU, or they're both tertiary level, but the Ottawa Hospital is for teeny tiny babies that are born there. Children's Hospital are tri transported babies with cardiac issues, genetic issues, etc. And then, immediately behind the Children's Hospital, there is the Roger Nielsen's house, um, uh, which is our pediatric hospice, which is part of our children's hospital and interesting enough there is a corridor that goes from the Ottawa hospital to the children's and then to the um, uh, hospice and so we can really wheel the mother the child uh, into the hospice if they decided at one point where the baby is gonna die okay so um, notice also um, this little kind of butterfly it's a nice thing we have, and now they are trying to do it in uh, Modena, in Reggio Emilia, <laughs> in, other, in other places in Italy when they saw this picture. But it's like, um, it, we call it the um, butterfly garden, and uh, there is a nice entrance which uh, talks about um, for all the child we love, and um, is um, a place where we remember the children that have, uh, that have left us uh, before once a year and the parents go there with their own families and uh, and siblings and everything is beautiful it's a moment of peace it's a moment of memory for them and they really really uh, cherish that uh, that uh, moment so um at that point i realized that i did not you know it was not only a question of writing new guidelines and and, and doing uh, other stuff there was more i mean I, I i need i really needed like i learned from elvira you know i really needed to look at the entirety so, you know when i when i think about the baby i think about the family of this baby and i really wanted them to have an experience for the family to be, to be a true family uh, while they were waiting for this baby to die and at the same time for the baby to be a baby of that family and not being a patient or a client like we do, right? So people warn me about being prepared for talking to the managers and fighting about it because they would say, okay, it's expensive, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, uh, we need a lot of, we don't have any, you know, lack of, uh, um, um, resources thank you resources and stuff like that but because I have I don't know if you know this guy but uh, just a joke <laughs> uh, Warren Buffett is uh, a guy that talks about risks obviously in finances um, and uh, but I didn't want to take the risk to um, actually uh, being asked f by my manager that you don't know what you're doing and so we don't take the risk, okay, of the, your proposal. Then, um, sorry, last night I tried to fix the numbers and I don't have it, but I'm gonna give it, <laughs> give it to you. So at the same time, getting ready for this, I did some research, so I needed to know how many babies were dying or in the process of dying or, you know, leaving and everything. And so what I realized that um, if you see the, the blue is 2017 and then um, uh, the green is in 2019. So we found that neonatal death had, in, uh, in um, neonatal death has, in, uh, sorry, sorry, whoops, wrong, go back. Okay, so neonatal death had had a um, hundred percent increase and if we talk about numbers um, it's like in the hundreds um, when we look at the perinatal death which has a per by definition is a stillborn in the period from 28 weeks to you know um, uh, seven days completed of life we had an increase of in our hospital of 100 percent actually two days before coming here i spoke to my uh, colleague and uh, she confirmed that we're going to be 200 percent increase in 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 um, in ottawa and this is exceptional because i think this was goes with the bill that uh, was passed and then allows parents 
to uh, actually to choose not to have an abortion and to see their babies. And so what you, were, what you saw in your experience is exactly what is happening to us in Canada right now. And I know that there are not very many places in Canada, as far as I know, that they offer this. Um, so I ask, obviously, I had to do quality uh, QI kind of surveys. And from the parents, you know, they said the paper wall is overwhelming. And so I learned that there was ev that everything that we offered the parents that they were coming with it, either a baby with life-limiting condition or deciding to, to be there and, and or, uh, you know, with an induction of labor or just a delivery that was premature and was not reaching the NICU, they were unsatisfied totally, totally, totally unsatisfied for all this reason that you see. When I look in Toronto that they have a bigger program um, and they look at 596 parents, our data matched completely with theirs. Okay, so lack of information, lack of knowledge, and this one involved physicians, MFM, nurses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, the, uh, you know, the nurses were, were uh, involved and, you know, it came out that they had a very strong desire, a little bit like Elvira said, strong desire to be with these parents, not to be disrupted in their work, to, 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 to have a relationship, that actually being supporting in that very moment with the family was highly rewarding for them. Now, there were some challenges in, you, in this survey that would uh, speak. Um, and for example, there was lack of protocols, order, knowledge, uh, what the pediatric hospice was, uh, a disconnect with the parents' expectation, an emotional burden by the, uh, by the nurses caring for these families, and the lack of resources like interrupted, interrupted care for, to, grieving, to, to grieving families. Um, so I had to redefine my goals. Uh, after learning that and get ready to go and, spoke and speak to, this, uh, to the manager, to the CEO or CEO of the hospital. So this, um, clearly I needed a, a standardized consultation process. Uh, I revised an update of the policy that, uh, of the end of life palliative care for infants with the life limiting condition. I wanted to create an algorithm for delivery of care also, including the decision with the location of the end of, of care would, would be. So at the hospital, uh, at home, or at the uh, hospice, at the pediatric hospice. And uh, I wanted to improve, improve the provision of comfort measures also with an order sheet because there was absolutely nothing outside from an ICU. You know, if a baby was gasping or it was having seizures or whatever, absolutely zero. Um, uh, and then I wanted to enhance, the, to enhance the, the bereavement support because we know that is very important. And as the title says that there is life before death, I would say that there is life also after death. And we're talking about the parents, the sibling, the grandparents. And this is society. So we, if we are able to support from the very beginning with an early consultation, bring, bring with a plan to birth and then follow and support the parents and the siblings afterwards, we're going to have a better outcome. Less people that are going to stay home because they're sick, they don't feel well, uh, you know, and with all the costs, if we want to call it, uh, you know, if we want to think of the Buffett way or my manager's way, it's the cost to society is major, you know, for a baby that dies because of all these reasons. Um, so this is only an example um, of the plan of care. You're going to see little feet going on. So if you have a baby with uh, a life-limiting condition, then uh, look, the consult, they're, they're going to be there. You can consult any of this accordingly to the situation and the, you know, the condition that the baby has. And, and then you can have a, a palliative care uh, you know, team that takes care of them um, at, the, at the time of birth. And then later on, um, you know, we're going to allow the baby to stay with the mother wherever they decide to be, in the hospital, in the hospice, or at home. And I did that, we did that for every single gestational age. Now, one thing that I wanted to, um, uh, to point is that people were very, very adamant not to talk about um, this. The decision when the parents decide to interrupt the pregnancy, okay? 
Um, we, have already, uh, we have already heard this morning, and mo many of the answers are already in what uh, you know, um, other colleagues have uh, spoken about. But I thought that actually um, to avoid into this process and to just try to forget that there is this part of parents that are still suffering, and there is a lot of work in terms of education to do with these parents um, uh, that was not correct. It was not right. I didn't want to discriminate these babies that are born you know, early and um, because of the, the parents, they don't want to inject KCL because they feel it's not good, it's not okay, but they <laughs> go ahead and they induct the labor, right? And so they're born normal, normal prematures completely healthy, and they live. So I, um, you know, my oldest, um, I always gone with the principle, um, Don Giussani taught me when I was a student that I cannot face reality if I don't take every single factor into consideration, everything, even the one that bothers you, even the one that for which you are scandalized, and even the one that really don't make you sleep at night, okay? And so I, I went ahead, I went to the JPCC, and last week they have approved it. So we're gonna go ahead with this. We have already started, to be honest with you, but um, you know, this is gonna be, sorry, this was all there, we're gonna go, tuck. So involvement of the, chi how much are you? Two minutes? One, one minute, okay. So. Palliative care team is, uh, you know, helping us uh, meeting with the families and a lot of stuff that, um, a lot of what we do and accompan accompanying these parents is the same that um, we, have, you know, America has Elvira, the lack of having Elvira around, uh, especially in New York. And we want to really maximize the quality of life and the time spent. Um, no matter what. We also care during labor, after labor, and we specifically go uh, our palliative care program has also support for grandparents and siblings, which is very, very important. And, um, um, and uh, one other thing that we have done is like, um, as a consultant neonatologist, I receive phone calls from uh, regional uh, hospitals. Um, and then sometimes I deal with either gynecologists or uh, general pediatricians that they are um, laboring, that they, 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 they do labors, right? And they have this baby that they are, uh, they never reach the NICU uh, because they are in tertiary center. And they are dealing with babies that are uh, alive and so they don't know what to do with them. And so we try to guide them. And so for this reason we have um, a order sheet medication on, of medication that are uh, possible to have in Canada. They are efficient but cheap, so we know that also in other hospitals have, uh, you know, the, the access to it, and uh, we are able to communicate with them all the time, and we have su successful t stories about that. Now, in terms of future direction, we need to, tra do, to train train and educate. Education is the must in this. Uh, there is a lot of not understanding, there is a lot of misunderstanding in this area of palliative care. Um, and um, obviously we always uh, ask the involvement of the parents, even so when they come, you know, they have 22 booklets and sometimes in the booklets they, they don't match with each other. They give confounding information and sometimes even opposite information. So we're trying to work with that. And then uh, um, we're strengthening the spiritual and ethical collaboration. In my group there are parents and they said that the spiritual um, you know, the spiritual uh, life uh, of there as a family, welcoming this baby that they know is going to depart, is very, very relevant for them. And they ask guidance, even if they're not um, religious, like they're not, you know, they're not uh, people that are not following any specific, you know, um, condition. The timeline would be January for being official. Um, I wanted to thank you specifically, my, my group, uh, that helped me so much, in particular Dr. Stephanie Van Zandt, and she's a palliative care team uh, um, leader, and uh, Jerry. Um, now, as I, I said, after life is very important because family is the network of our society. If that was, is not supported properly and with uh, proper 
you know, um, attention, um, it fails badly. And uh, to me, uh, yesterday somebody asked, is there, you know, facing life in all aspects with all the images that we see, we saw, um, is there, you know, a risk that we can take? I would say that in front of life, in all its aspects and challenges, even if they are harsh, um, it is always worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. For the last uh, half an hour, 20 minutes of this talk, we will be together. And I'd like, if you want, to bring you with me at the palliative care unit and discuss things very close of the day-to-day -day life. Not because it's not useful to have a, a, a view from above. It is. But it's not enough. You need both. I have no conflict to report, and I will go short, shortly for the first slides because I want to have more time and the time is short. We know who we are. We all have our own identity. And this identity comes from the physical that I have, the color of my skin, the culture of my family, my religious uh, faith and my occupation. And we all need to know who we are, and in fact, I would say, to become who we really are. If you look in a mirror, you don't see yourself. You see your opinions about yourself. If you think that your nose is big, it's much bigger. <laughs> it's not the right way to know who you are. Who tells you who you are? The people who live with you, who look at you who interact with you, and from which you have some insights. Identity is a gift. And these gifts, we gain it very rapidly when we're very young. Because when we are very young, there's a lot of things to experience with family, friends, colleagues, and all. The identity changes, mature rapidly. And when we become adult, because now we're used to who we are and we know ourselves better, the change of identity becomes slow, much slower. And in fact, very often at 35 or 40 years old, we are immortal. Our life is like it is. We have choose it. We, are, uh, we look at our own rights. We are self-made persons. The role of others in our, our life is a bit ignored. But we know that we don't want to be like this sick person here. We want to stay in this immortal plateau. But sometime a disease arrives, and then all what you have built crumbles. Your physical is not the same. Your reassuring daily activities disappear. You have some psychological suffering. We can discuss that. And spiritual anxieties. No, I did not achieve my true goals. Maybe some of those priorities was wrong. It's too li late, no. I have misused some of my time. Am I really the person I thought I was? And you know, if you're sick uh, in an acute disease, the physical uh, thing is very important. The S for the spiritual is very small. I'm 30, 23 years old, appendicitis, looking at, the, at, the, uh, at the, uh, the, the room, and I have no spiritual questions. I think that my surgeon will cure the appendicitis. But if I'm 85 and I am nothing to do for my physical, the vast space of question is of spiritual origin. And if you get a bad disease, and you slowly kind of get down, there's a period there between the time that you had no questions about identity and the time that you're going to die, which is a very precious time. This time must be, uh, must be uh, uh, fostered in a very special way. It's true that we come in the state of lower self-esteem, not able to do. And uh, the, uh, the, the thinking of the sick person 
becomes very different from the person who is not sick. It's a bit like if all the priorities of my life was in a big sieve, small priorities and big priorities, and then happened the disease. The sieve is shaken, all the small priorities goes to the, to the, to the floor, remains only the big ones, ones who have a name on it. It's my brother that I haven't spoke for four years. It's my ex-wife that I want to say something to. And I have to say something to her now because there will be no future. This becomes a new priority. And uh, this may seem to you a disaster, but there's also a new mobility in there. Now you have a chance to address important questions that were obliterated by all sorts of small priorities before. So you become again in the search of a new, more important, profound identity. Dr. Saturday, don't be too much morphine. Sometimes I sleep with it. She comes to see me and I want to say her something. And you understand that he could have done so before. But he didn't because there was too many priorities in the sieve. Now he wants to. And in fact, this is an identity question. He wants to show himself in a different way to her. And the patient, therefore, in this sp spanning of time, is looking again for the mirror of others. He has to be accompanied. He has to have somebody to listen to him. And he has to come again in realizing who he is, who he is. At the end of life, there's a period of rapid identity change. And this rapid identity change can be seen as a maturation of identity, becoming who we really are. And the palliative care will do that, will help to do that, because it restores your autonomy, it alleviates the physical uh, discomfort in allow to restore personal relationships, help of constituting uh, 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 last contact with persons. Palliative care can come very late here. Whoop, sorry. Very late, just before uh, it goes, uh, it goes, it drops to start toward death. This is very useful. Should we uh, inscribe this patient palliative care? Oh, this is much too early. This is the wrong answer. Palliative care should start whenever there is a diagnosis of something wrong, very wrong, occurring. Having palliative care, all that period of change together with the patient. Mad or maid, uh, we won't discuss. With the help of palliative care, the life at the end can become more dense. Memorial become more deep. Rapid maturation can occur. And we go for comfort to contact, to conversation, to transformation. This is uh, in the first box, if you have no palliative care. Well, in this time, you, don't, you cannot be well comfortable. If you're not comfortable, you cannot have contacts. If you cannot have contacts, you're slowly getting into isolation, you're flowing into depression, and you die. But if you have palliative care, and it, that it's of good quality, then you suddenly are relieved, can have contacts, and talk to your family, there is a space open for you that I will call the palliative space. And at the end of this palliative space, you have a coma, a very superficial coma, where the person is there, hearing everything, but not answering to everything. And of course, the patient dies. He dies when he's ready to die. My sister arrives on Friday, and mother stays until Friday. 
until the sister arrives. She dies when she's ready. Oh, we have to find a good place for Francis. Francis is a trisomy 21, and her mother is dying, and she won't die until she hears we have to find a nice uh, room for Francis. So it is until this coma, it is a very important part. I'm saying to you that with palliative care, there's some light in the difficult process because it is a difficult process. But sometimes there is no light at all. There is no life at all. Patient doesn't want to see you. He, he wants to cease to life, he wants to die. And then you have a problem, what can we do with him? There's no meaning for the present moment for him. Uh, the presence of others is unwelcome. He don't want to be seen with this situation he's in. There's a loss of confidence in the present, in the future. He brings the sheet over his head and there's no bridge possible between us. What should we do? Abandon him? He doesn't relationship? Let's let, let him go. Or should we knock on the door? But if we continue to knock on the door, we have to do that in a very, very delicate fashion, very respectful for him. But maybe we should do something. And it's difficult for me. It's difficult for the person with him because all words are suspect. Nothing that you say is really what you intend to say understood by him. A hand is offered but meets only a patient refusal. The room is filled with a heavy, uneasy silence. There is existential suffering everywhere. What can we do? We want to use some relational creativity and start and try to initiate the conversation. And to do that, I would like to show you one way. And the one way to take care of this palliative space, to have it more, uh, more in, to have it better, we can use the ocean drum experience. This is an ocean drum. If I take this tool, Moving beats, slow rhythm, no magics, a disponibility. In the silence that was a heavy silence, something else is appearing. Something that makes a regular noise. Something where I will walk in outside of this prison of my previous thoughts a place large enough where we can be two. The unexpected sound occupies all the space. A new silence arrives, more fertile. A few space, a new space that becomes a possible site for encounter. Some time passes and I'm still there. And maybe a few steps together in the sand is possible. Something is occurring outside of me, outside of my problems, outside of my despair. And this may be very useful. And you know what? Sometime before our 
Coming to this world, we were enveloped by the warm amniotical fluid, floating freely, rocked by the movements of mother, and we have this wonderful sensation of security. And we were hearing the deep sound of the placentary flow. Closely associated with this sensation of being so well. And this flow was like waves on the beach, coming regularly, loaded with certitude. And it was even difficult to hear the little heart beating at 120. Impossible because of the vast uh, sound of the inner sea. A world of absolute comfort. Paul Valéry would say, skin is the deepest part of me. This is referring to the experience of being touched when you were a baby and floating in the mother's womb. Is it possible that we are some souvenirs of this period of our lives? And if we have some souvenirs, are those souvenirs close to the sea flowing in waves? And if this is true, are those souvenirs able to help preparing a new birth? Now, even if the, the, the hand was not there, the desire was not there, a new path is possible. And sometime, not all the time, this will awake the desire to share. And the patient starts to see what's come up at low tide. When the water gets out, suddenly the nature is different. He shares thoughts, emotions. He recalls past moments of his life. He's touching his changing self-identity. And I'm with him in a new space. I have nothing to say. I have to be with him. I don't want to lead him. I want to listen to him with no judgments. I remember a patient coming with a lady of 50 years old with a history of using cocaine for a long time with a lot of pain because of pancreas cancer. And she would say, I don't want to see you. Go to hell. The first thing we did to increase by five times the drugs that she had for her pain because addicts need five times more than non-addicts. And one of the problems that nobody had thought that she would not respond normally. Then she went quite nicer. The, the pain was gone away. And we had to play a little bit of drum. And we play, I played with her a little bit of drum. And suddenly she said, I want to see my daughter. There was no idea that there was a daughter. We found the daughter. The next Saturday she came in, a small lady with uh, ink in the skin uh, from the ear to the toe, Sp small like, um, like my uh, finger. She came into the unit, wasn't sure to continue. Our nurse took her in her, in her arm and in the afternoon, there was two women on the bed. Mom had not seen the, the, the daughter for 10 years. Should, would she had asked to see the daughter if the space of communication was not open before? Now take me, I'm not saying that this is a magical tool. I'm saying that we need creativity in relationship, that we don't want to go through the past that is blocked. We want to find new path, path that goes by outside, create a new presence with her and show her that you don't want to abandon or show him that you don't want to abandon him. And suddenly, low tide conversation brings things that you could not see before. 
This is the land when the water has receded. The, 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 the image is very different. The effect, culpability becomes confidence. Incapacity becomes abandon. Confusion becomes a new order. Undignity becomes self-esteem. Uncertain identity becomes a larger identity. Loss of meaning becomes a hope for meaning and a hope to be able to do the last priorities of life. Thank you. Just talk. Oh, there we go. LV, I'm curious if you've had any pushback from your OB colleagues or anyone who is, you know, pro abortion and how you've addressed that with, you know, with other physicians. I know, you know, with families, perhaps you can convince them, you know, it, that the life of their baby is, is worth living even for 30 minutes an hour. But with your other professional colleagues who are like sometimes so professional that that they're more callous perhaps than, than the mother of the child. How do you have that conversation with them and showing that, that your work is really, you know, uh, worth doing? Yeah. Uh, I'm asked I'm ask very often a question like this and, you know, it, 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 I was never in such a situation. So keep in mind that I'm, so this pro program, uh, this team has been in my hospital for years and uh, so the uh, responsible MFM in my hospital actually wrote an ACOG opinion uh, regarding the importance of perinatal palliative care. Mm, although I don't think he shares my same um, view of sanctity of life, but uh, I think at this point, because of the history together, they recognize the usefulness of this uh, service that we provided for many, many families who are looking for this uh, option. Um, my colleagues, neonatologists, are extremely happy that I do this because um, for some people it's hard to face um, consultation when you cannot give the in intensivist option. Um, and uh, instead for me is I love to do this. I love to accompany families and so, in reality, I never had any uh, problem. I always place myself as, uh, you know, this is my proposal, this is my option, I'm happy to accompany a family. So it's been very smooth and very well recognized. Uh, just a personal comment on the importance of the birth certificate and the death certificate, and I was in a different situation where we lost twins at 16 weeks, and my funeral director got fought and got the death certificate, unbeknownst to me, because we, we had a funeral, but we wouldn't be able to bury the babies in a cemetery without a death certificate. So that's another piece of um, just, I don't know others in, in the medical situation, but that's a, a piece that needs to be addressed for um, bearing infants that aren't, uh, that are too young to have a birth certificate and that aren't born alive. Thank you. I work as an internal medicine hospitalist and so I deal a lot with um, end stage anything, um, heart failure, cancer, and they come in in acute situations. Um, and I find myself a lot of times meeting the patients for the first time and the families, but also kind of seeing that what's being done, the seventh cycle of chemo in the 88-year-old man or the LVAC in you know, the 95-year-old heart failure patient, um, almost like that at a certain point, they're almost waiting for somebody to say, it's okay to stop. Um, but there's always that internal struggle because you see that whether you're two days old or 95, the desire to live is always there. And so I always struggle um, in the moment, almost like resisting the knowledge that I should help them accept the life is coming to an end. And also the conversations that I end up having 
with my friends not in the medical field, like, oh my gosh, you pulled the plug on this person. And a lot of times, it's not as clear cut as a 95 year old. It can be a 30 year old with end stage cancer who has kids the same age as mine, which is not as easy, but you still see that's the right thing to do. And so I guess my question is, um, even with the decision, like the example you gave of the girl with the one ventricle, and you know the decision to not be aggressive, um, like how are you at ease with when you help these people accept that it's the end, when you still want to respect the sanctity of life? And I don't know, like do you ever find yourselves torn in that, I don't know, borderline? So one thing that I always tell the parents of my babies when I introduce myself, uh, because they ask me, what do we do, what not we do, and I always say to them, I follow your baby. I believe in destiny of people, and uh, I believe that the reality um, of the patient is telling me which way is baby's gonna go. I'm not God, you know, they are not God, the parents, and so I think uh, physicians, nurses, professionals, and family needs to follow the objectivity of what is happening in that patient if we want to follow a destiny, okay? So, um, and then as an example that I gave it to you, you know, uh, single ventricle is a very complex uh, condition. There is no cure. There are palliation surgeries. There is transplant. And, you know, it's something that we do, we offer, and we are happy to do that. But, you know, it's different from transposition of the grave vessels or the tragedy of a law, okay? So, uh, but to me, the, going back, the point is, whatever situation I am, I look at the reality of my baby within the context of the family and the medical condition, et cetera, looking for point to be enlightened, to follow that baby. Reality is telling me all the time, which is the next step, and so then I share with the family, we discuss, and, and it's very dramatic. It's not that, oh, I see reality, I see, okay, I will have to do this. I mean. It's a dramatic conversation where I put all my knowledge, all my experience. I, don't, I want to be honest also to all the objective signs. I need to know that patient perfectly. I need to know all the blood tests. I need, like it's a very um, d difficult and challenging job, but, but I need to follow somebody else. Echo, that's the point. You know, <clears throat> I do with uh, just one comment. We doctors are very proud of what we do. And therefore, we develop an impression that what, you do, what we do is extremely important, and it is in a way. But it's also not entirely true. You stop the medication to this person, you expect that he's going to die in hours, and a month later, he's still here. And this is a very common experience. We did well with this patient. But maybe we should accept that we can also look at the discomfort and accept that we don't know what's going to happen if the specific treatment becomes over-treating, uh, something that you ha really had to stop, is also a possibility. We're not, w our treatments do not give life. And in a way, it may prolong life, but will not give life. And life is not going to disappear because you disappear. <laughs> the, the second thing I wanted to say, it's very clear when you hear Elvira answering the last questions. We need the Elvira doctor. We need the Elvira lady. Mother, maybe, I don't know, but lady. And the patient need both, and both good. A good doctor, but also a good person. A person that can resonate with him. And this space of resonation is exactly like the uh, uh, ocean drum. It's a place where you see things a bit differently. And I would, uh, I would say that if you're not ready for the encounter, which is at the core of what you do to the patient, if you're not ready, even the drugs won't work as well. You're not really in the real place 
we're always in an encounter, even when you're not at the end of the life. And the encounter part must be looked at. And sometimes, using an artificial or a, a, a different way to get around a mountain is the way to go. Je vais faire mes commentaires en français. Je vais demander à quelqu'un de peut-être résumer en anglais. OK. I will... Um, you will do it? I will do it. OK. <laughs> you speak slowly. Oui. D'abord, no. merci vraiment à tout le monde. Thank you, ici. everybody. Peut-être... Euh, je... Attendez okay. de... Je vais faire ça par portion. <laughs> euh, je trouve que euh, la richesse des euh, conférences euh, était vraiment... Euh, comment dire? Nous amène dans un monde de, de complexité. Et chaque euh, sujet... Euh, ne peut pas entraîner une réponse unique. Euh, je suis euh, tout à fait d'accord avec les derniers intervenants sur repenser les choses d'une façon différente. Et euh, je pense que l'approche ne peut pas être seulement médicale, elle doit, être, euh, elle doit intégrer tous les aspects de l'aide à la personne. Euh, le service social, la spiritualité, la psychologie, la médecine, enfin tout. Et euh, donc, euh, il me semble qu'il euh, devrait y avoir aussi d'autres euh, intervenants ici. Ça, c'est une partie de mon de, une partie de l'intervention. L'autre partie, c'est justement en rapport avec euh, Madame euh, de l'enfant qui est mort. Écoutez, euh, j'ai pensé à cette, euh, à cette histoire qui, effectivement, nous, nous incite presque à pleurer et au travail de deuil. Et cette femme était partie sans avoir travaillé le deuil de cet enfant. Et c'est ça qui n'a pas été euh, adressé. Et, et il manque de services psychologiques partout, on le sait. Il faut vraiment faire en sorte que ce service soit inclus un peu partout pour euh, permettre aux autres personnes de la famille de vivre. Car euh, ce que moi, j'y vois, et peut-être que vous, vous l'avez vu aussi, mais c'était l'enfant qui est mort, comme il n'a pas été enterré, il est encore vivant. Et il, il sont... Euh, c'est l'enfant rêvé qui ressuscite. Et donc, elle attendait l'enfant rêvé et c'était, ça devait, devait être une fille, mais ça a été un garçon. Alors, ce garçon n'a pas de droit de vivre actuellement. Et euh, l'enfant rêvé, parce que l'enfant qu'on a, ce n'est pas un enfant parfait, hein? c'est un enfant qui pleure, c'est un enfant qu'on qui, qu n'aime pas toujours. Alors, euh, cet enfant mort et devient l'enfant rêvé. Et, et, et il n'est pas à travailler non plus. Alors, ce n'est pas vous, à vous, le médecin, de le faire. C'est à une équipe de le faire. Alors, je voudrais amener cette réflexion-là euh, pour finir. OK. So, um, first thing, Louise wanted to thank everybody, uh, thank the pe people who spoke at the conference, the richness of the conference that was, uh, was really beautiful, and, and, it, and it brings forth or emerges, uh, it brings forth a world of complexity uh, for which there might not be simple and single, single answers. However, they are re uh, uh, forcing us to rethink things in a different way. Uh, not, only, uh, that not only a medical approach, uh, maybe the answer, but other aspects must be considered and other approaches, uh, social, psychological, spiritual, and at other um, people, other, uh, other um, providers, I hate that word, healthcare professionals, or uh, other people are, 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 are necessary as well. Now, regarding, uh, regarding the baby, do you want to answer that directly and, and repeat the question too? Yes. 
So she, uh, she was saying that uh, that mother was unable to um, the mother th my uh, yeah was unable to grieve uh, the loss of the baby girl. It was not done. Yes, it was very difficult. And then she was advocating for um, a social a psychologist to help this mother to um, actually grieve the loss of the twin that she lost. And even uh, um, uh, the, for the, the fact that she didn't grieve uh, brought up another issue. When she had the baby boy um, uh, that was born with needs and crying, it was, uh, she used the, 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 um, the term resuscitate, like the baby <laughs> resuscitate, like um, uh, rises again. Yeah, but it's not a baby girl, it's a baby boy, and so it's a further complication in our mind, in the mind of the mom. And so she was uh, advocating for, um, uh, you know, uh, support for this mom. Um, now the story went that I, um, um, I spoke to her, I met with her, and I tried to enhance aspects of, uh, you know, the care that uh, she was missing. And so she has been seen, uh, she has been followed, and things are going really well. And she had other babies after <laughs> the baby boy, so she had another, another girl. Um, and um, uh, this, this is a, it's, it's a great, um, you know, um, it for me it was definitely a trigger to ask the presence of a psychologist in, uh, um, in, in this program, on this uh, project that I have, not only for the parents, but also for the nurses and for the medical, uh, because uh, the burden of this and taking care, you need to know what to say, you need to know how to say, you need to know, you know how to support them properly. Uh, otherwise you risk also to burn yourself, like, thank you. <laughs>